Hello, Mark. Welcome. Welcome to hey, another Justin. episode of our fantastic show, Reactor. And I hear you just hit a goal. What goal did you just hit? I published three episodes. <laughs> I published three screencasts to YouTube. Oh, that's nice. Yes. Very uh, that's, good. Uh, a bit of a stretch for me, but I made it this week. Okay. Awesome. Like I've just got a 10 seconds ago. Oh, you literally just did it right there. I just published it while you were setting up your sound. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I've just got this new uh, pile. Uh, it's called a pile sound card thing. It's, look, this is it. So basically, nice. it, it does phantom power, and it, it does like a mix of audio and mic. So I've never used it before. Let's see what happens. It's yeah. Just, yeah. I, by the way, I like this background. Like, Oh, yeah? Outdoor view. That's nice. Like, I bet this... that's going to like be way more engaging. Well, uh, this is not something that I can do regularly. I mean, I suppose I could in our house, but right now we're in Grandma's house. Oh, okay. We're on vacation for a week in Grandma's house in Santa Maria. Nice. Well, you know, keep, keep in mind, like I, I live someplace with uh, like uh, a tenth of the land of Japan and as many people as Australia. So oh my God. I'm not used to seeing yards. So to me, like, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, it's crazy. Everything's so giant in America. Yeah, lots of space. I think Australia's got to be the same way. Yeah. And Canada, maybe Canada more so. I, I uh, haven't been there in ages, but uh, I have a, a couple cousins that live in Quebec City, okay. which is like a couple hours north of Montreal. Mm -hmm. And they have like so many maple trees, they can send us syrup every year. <laughs> it's like 50 or 80 or something. But how many, how many bottles of syrup does one maple tree give you? Way less than one. No way. Yeah, yeah. You have to, like, we used to have two at my old house where I grew up, and I wanted to make maple syrup as a kid, and I kept asking my family, and they're like, like, if you boiled this down, we'd have, like, one teaspoon or something. Oh, my gosh. So, so maple syrup, that's why it's so expensive, obviously. Yeah, because you, you have to, I guess, take some of the sap out of it. Like, you tap the tree, mm -hmm. and you get a whole bunch of sap from a whole bunch of maple trees and then you just boil it and boil it. And I'm, I'm not sure what all is involved, but it doesn't yield that much syrup. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. So good to have cousins in Canada. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So what else so, is going on for you, sir? Okay. So let's see. Um, I have been doing some prep for, uh, for that technical interview. Oh yeah. And the I've Facebook. also been, yeah. Yep. I haven't I haven't written that much JavaScript in like three or four years, and they I don't think they have any Elixir at Facebook. They have Erlang because of WhatsApp, oh, yeah. but okay. but they don't. I mean, basically, like for an interview at a big company, it's basically got to be you know C, C plus plus, Python, Java, or JavaScript mm -hmm. at most places. You know, like if you go to Stripe, I'm sure you do Ruby, but um, you know they don't they don't have uh, so many interviewers, they'll just, you know, find someone who uses whatever language you like. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then also just kind of the, the mental fitness of, of, uh, uh, of doing like a, a timed technical interview. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of algorithm problems and a lot of stuff that I know and I've done and I did well at like five years ago. But, uh, you know, if you haven't, if you haven't actually forced yourself to solve those with a time constraint in a while, like it doesn't, doesn't necessarily go well. I repeat that I find it such a strange way to hire people. Um, a timed interview, it's very strange. Like maybe, so maybe school does have one, does teach us for one type of thing, which is um, a timed interview if you're a programmer. That's what school, because school teaches you to, you know, to do tests. Um, but apart from that, schools, what else does it do? <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> for the think real most... world. Yeah, I don't think most graduates necessarily do well at those either. Like they, they've had the like they've they've taken the data structures and algorithms courses, but mm -hmm. unless they're into competitive programming, they they probably haven't been solving that many problems under those kind time constraints either. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I I think it started reasonably. It was like the whole FizzBuzz thing. It was just like, is this person a complete fraud? Like, can they program at all? Yeah, I, I, test. the kind of questions I thought were cool and interesting were like, you know, how do they make M&Ms? 
Oh, you know, those you know. brain teaser things. Yeah, so it's, it's not really about your coding. It's just like, it's about your thought process. Describe to me step by step how you think they make M&Ms. And so then you can sort of see them thinking through the different ideas and different concepts and um, come, you know, coming up with stuff. And that's really what you want in a good, a great, well, a startup dev anyway. I don't know about like a, like a, a major corporation dev, but in a startup dev, that's yeah. what I'm looking for. It's also probably harder to quantify. So like if you're a big company and you're giving this interview to hundreds of candidates, how do you make sure that you're, you're ranking them fairly? I guess. Yeah. One thing I can say, though, is like the first startup where I worked, uh, the one in Beijing, we had uh, tons and tons, like hundreds and hundreds of applicants. And we actually gave them FizzBuzz, like literally, you know, do the FizzBuzz problem. And under 5% could do it. And most of them were saying they were iOS experts. Um, some of them like couldn't use a Mac. So what like, is we, FizzBuzz? We, I mean, oh, I, probably, I probably couldn't do it now that I'm sure you can. I'm, if you can't do it, like you, th this was a, a Joel Spolsky idea, which was, okay. which was basically like this is just to make sure the person can write code as opposed to the person's read lots of blog posts about code. Okay. Um, you ask them to print out all the numbers between uh, 1 and 100, except every third number print out fizz, and every fifth number print out buzz. So it's like one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, eight, okay. fizz, not, uh, buzz for 10, and then 15, yeah. fizz, buzz, because it's divisible by three and five. So everything divisible by 15, you print fizz, buzz. So that's it. Just everything, you either print out the number or fizz or buzz or fizz, buzz. So does that mean that basically if they don't know what the mo what mod is, they, they can't pass the test? Um, I mean, that would be the most straightforward way to do it as modulus, but, um, yeah, it, I mean, it means they need to, they need to be able to. Okay. So, so I, so they could also just divide into it and see if there's zero left over. Got it. You would done oh, the mod is just the quicker, the quicker version. Got it. Yeah. Or, or they could, uh, they could have like a secondary loop. You could go like, you could loop 15 numbers at a time and, you know, on, on uh, oh, the third yeah. iteration of it, you print a fizz, and the other ones you print like n or whatever the actual. Oh yeah, is. multiple like different loops within loops. Yeah, you could. I mean, that that is not the way you should do it, but you could do it that way. Wait, how would that work? So, so you you'd basically you'd basically have your iteration from one to a hundred. Yeah. You'd have a, you'd have another. Uh, you'd basically be. Uh, having a loop counter as you're going through uh, so what like so so in got, other words what you're saying is if <laughs> you could if, be if, if i equals if i equals three then print fizz if i equals uh you know what were the what were the increments every three was it every three and then every five for buzz so you'd have like a big you could have like a big switch statement if i equals three if i equals six if i equals nine then you then you print one otherwise you print n or whatever yeah. you know whatever your your <laughs> nice. external one is um I guess you could, you could also um, keep four variables, and one of them, one of them you keep incrementing um, up to fifteen, and one of them you go up to five, and one of them you go up to three, and then once it hits that limit, you reset to zero. You'd be basically building your own modulus. Or you could do a hundred set timeouts, just increment like an extra, like you know, half a second on each timeout. And they print yeah. exactly what you want to print. You could hard code it. Yeah, I mean, you could just hard code a single print statement with the whole yeah. answer too. But um, this this is a famous problem. Like I've I've okay. seen um, like on GitHub, I've seen a repo with like hundreds of Java files. It was like the enterprise fizz buzz thing. <laughs> and it's like a, it's like this this fizz buzz <laughs> factory creator <laughs> handler something. Just it, it was a complete joke, but it, it worked. It really goes to show, I mean, that's exactly what real, real code is like. I mean, you go into some systems and you're like, dude, why is there this giant Java st stack just to print a login page? This is just unbelievable. You could just do this with HTML, you know? It's a lot of, a lot of ceremony. <laughs> so, yeah. So, anyway, we, we found it useful because there were a lot of people applying for programming jobs that like, just don't program at all. Interesting. Yeah, that is true. A lot. 
I've I've seen that as well. But I usually kind of can tell from the from the resume in the first place. I mean, you can just tell if so, I. I a lot of the time I can tell and then a few get through and then you can tell in the interview just by asking a couple of simple questions you know like what's your uh, what's your tool chain uh, uh, yeah uh, my tool chain is uh, you know I use a Mac uh, yeah you know that's sort of where it ends and then yeah. you know yeah okay what's the yeah. hardest thing about what, what's the most frustrating thing about the tool chain you work with I mean that's you, you'll, you'll get like everyone who doesn't know how to code will not be Maybe. able to ask that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know the answer for me. What is, VS, tell code, me. VS code updates every month. And when they make a new feature, they want to make sure we discover the feature. So they just enable everything by default. So as yeah. a result, every month there's a risk that something that's like deeply ingrained part of my workflow does some new thing that I don't want. Yeah. Huh? I think basically the hardest part of any tool chain is other people. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like at every at every step now it's either like your other developers who you work with or it's your other people who build the libraries or it's the people who maintain the the red hat or whatever the system is because there's so many other people involved that they can just do something by mistake <laughs> that just screws everything up and then you've got to look deep. Like those those are kind of the main bugs that I encounter it, either I can typically I find okay I'll solve a bug in like 10 minutes or it's going to take me like five days <laughs> you know if yeah. it's, not, if it's yeah. not quick then it's just like really esoteric and deep like one like one bug I had with um, Laravel um, mm -hmm. the bug was I can't remember exactly what it were, was but it was a word like retain or something like that so anywhere where there was where there was a word retain inside um, a string in SQL, the retain is the wrong word. I, I posted it on Hacker News. I can't remember what the word was, but let's just for the sake of this story, retain. So basically, every, it was a free form text uh, that people could could post, like a comments type system. And when this one word was inserted in SQL, it would cr it would cause a core dump, and there was no kind of logs, nothing. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> so it took ages to just finally trace it back. You know, oh wait, all of these posts have that. You know, they're long. They're like a thousand word posts or whatever, but they have this one word, and then this word is going through the SQL system and it's blowing, it's blowing up the system. So. Yeah, we we had a thing like that when I was at Groupon with CoffeeScript. It was uh, we we had these uh, nested maps or uh, nested objects like JavaScript objects, mm -hmm. and they had the keyword class in it oh. as a key. So yeah. like, it, it, like it, had, it had class as one of the keys, and the way that the CoffeeScript compiler worked at that time, there was, uh, there was a bug around that. So um, everything was breaking, and it was very mysterious. We, we actually had to uh, submit a fix to the, the compiler to get around that. There was... Um, was it there was something, there was another thing on Hacker News quite recently. I can't remember what it was, but it was talking about, oh yeah, it was the, the post about Lightspeed. Did you see that? I didn't. I, I sent you a different post I was really interested in though. Okay. But, uh, maybe, Can actually, I... how about, how about our, our goals for, like, finish our, our progress and then, then go to your, your post? Oh, okay. Um, so what was my goals again? Um, I think it was to like launch the, launch the, the launch the bootcamp. Launch bootcamp. Yeah. So I didn't do that, but I, I, I do have it reviewed um, and I do have the testimonials that I want. Um, and, you know, I would be good to launch it if I didn't then go back and look at the whole journey, like holistically and go, I kind of need to rework Nugget now, you know? Like it doesn't, okay. Okay. The, the like the Nugget Startup Academy doesn't make sense being there. So I need to sort of make it, okay, you come in as a free user, Indie Founder Bootcamp is the homepage. Then you join the Slack. Then I, then I needed to think through, okay, I need to rework Slack to make it more engaging. And okay. then um, when you finish the Bootcamp, then it unlocks the Startup Academy. So, so that's you, what I'm working on now. You pulled Rejigging. a thread. Yeah, you yeah. pulled a thread and then you got like the whole cotton tree orchard. That's a good, yeah. Or opened the can and got the worms. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, um, but it is going to be within the next two weeks, I think. I'm pretty sure. Not, maybe not by next week, but certainly by the week after, it will be out there. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that. Um, 
yeah, and that's that's really my. And then I'll be getting into task flow. <laughs> that's the dream. That's the dream. That's that's like me talking about my uh, my next series I'm doing on Alchemist Camp because yeah. uh, the simple the simple Phoenix Live View app has turned into the longest series I've ever done because the library keeps upgrading and and every time I I do some feature for our site I'm like oh yeah this will be like one maybe two screencasts and it turns out to be like five but it's just some things about just done. take some things just take the time that they take I mean there's nothing you can do about it you know. I'm, yeah, now I'm I'm pretty sure it's just one more left, though. <laughs> okay, let's see. So how about yeah. you? So what's your... Uh, so the big one... Uh, yeah. My big goal was get the three screencasts launched uh, or okay. published. And that's that's because, you know, I, I said, like, I was worried about the top-of-the-line growth on Alchemist Camp. Um, my YouTube channel growth was amazing uh, right after I launched Phoenix Igniter, and it's slowed down since... And I think a lot of it is just I haven't been publishing enough videos. And YouTube, you know, kind of, there is, it does reward what's been published recently. Uh, so, I, you know, I did two last week, tried to do three, but I did two. And then this week I did three. And now all of a sudden, like, the growth is picking up again. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of on, that, on that content treadmill. How are we doing with our uh, show, show listens and stuff? Oh, I sent you an image. Uh, so, so we were at seventy-seven listens in the last ten days last time. Yeah. Now we're at a hundred and one. So, that's real. That's uh, real growth. Yeah, that's that's on the podcast side, but okay. that is yeah, that is real growth. Then on the YouTube side, uh, we're up to nineteen subscribers. So I think that was plus one wow. or plus two. Yeah. That's so cool. That's it's, so cool. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's getting more. Um, getting more of an interest than I expected, to be honest. Yeah, well, me too. Um, but thank you um, for, to anyone who's listening. And um, again, if you want an intro, um, I will do that. And I, especially, I'm excited to do the intro now because uh, for the game, the Roblox game that I'm building, or well, that I'm paying someone else to build, I just joined a, um, a sound library uh, site. And uh -huh. I've got some good ideas to add to the intro there. Um, to make it more interesting. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. So, and it would be great to see people going to reactor.am and leaving comments. Oh yes, please do, for sure. And um, yeah. And so, by the way, I I will I will not be doing an intro unless ten people ask for it. Now that could be by the comments. That's fine by me. By the comments or by the email. You could re you could email hosts at reactor.am. We go to comments. That'd be perfect. Very nice. So, um, so you want to talk about that post? Lightspeed? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's go. Let's go over your hacker news post, then we'll go over okay. mine. Okay. So it's this classic. It's it's the it's a story that's gone around a few times, and it has been posted to Hacker News a few times. And basically, it the story is um, obviously I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it's something like that. My email will only go a hundred miles, or something like that. It's like this, you know. I can't send an email any further than like 100 miles or, or 200 miles or something like that. So there's, um, there's and it's a, it's a very old, it's an old story. It's like kind of 30 or 25 years old type thing. And so this um, sysadmin, you know, one of the professor for the statistics department comes into him and says, look, I can't send an email any more than 100 miles, whatever that is, maybe 100, 200, 400 or something. I think it might have been 400. But anyway, the guy, the guy, the the guy goes, okay, that's basically impossible because you know that's just not how technology works. That's not how the internet works. And um, <clears throat> but anyway, he's very super curious about it, and especially interesting because the guy says, look, you know, we're we're the department of statisticians, you know, and we've done a lot of analysis and a lot of tests, and we sent emails to here and here and here and here and here, and every time the emails just dies at this particular mile marker. <laughs> so he's like, wait a second, how can an email die at a mile marker? Anyway, he goes deeper into it and what he sees that some consultant for the university recently configured SendMail and they did it in such a way that they upgraded it and that there was um, a bunch of values in the new SendMail that was upgraded that were not 
addressed with the configuration file. So that what happened was they were given default value, default value, default values of zero. Uh -huh. And when he essentially burnt it all down, it was based on the ping, a ping response. So this thing was uh. like, if it didn't get a ping response, um, it was, it stopped at that point. So essentially he was like, okay, what is the speed of light? Okay. This is the speed of light. The speed of light would dictate that, that, you know, this ping is going to get about 400 miles or however many miles it was, you know, and, Interesting. and that was essentially what he, you know, f found the bug to be. The bug was the speed of light. <laughs> I guess if they all, yeah, if you have fiber optic cables. Yeah, yeah right. that's, that's interesting. Um, I never heard about that, but upgrading is dangerous. Yeah, and um, I've got another story a bit like that, after, but if you want to do your one first, that's fine. Yeah, uh, I sent you the link. I, <clears throat> I don't know if you saw it yet or not, but there was a, a big post on Twitter um, where, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep, so this guy... Uh, I think this is a, an anonymous account or pseudonymous account, but he said, uh, "Why Combinator's lost its soul? Why see founders' perspective? Batches are the batches and checks are too big, and the team is too small, making it marginally useful unless you're a B to B SaaS or Dev Tool company, and it's filled with tech climbers." And he he elaborates on each of the points, um, and it, and it's it's interesting that the part that really stuck out to me he, he, he seems like he he was in yc and he's not uh he doesn't seem like he's just a purely angry person yeah but he said uh back in the day it was you and like 20 other companies but you got the personal attention of people like paul graham jessica livingston and trevor blackwell tight-knit network of similarly driven people doing shit that was actually new today the batches are huge um, they'll tell you, keep your heads down, just building and selling, but the game has changed. Now it's more about FaceTime with partners, building hype, fundraising. And he also said that there are different kinds of people that are in it now. Like before it was people who were kind of, uh, doing something that MBAs would avoid. And it, it was, you know, it was not a normal thing to, you know, drop out of college or, or not get a job and do a tech startup in 2006 or 2007. Uh, but now uh, it's other, he says the bio cohort is interesting, but now it's, it's a huge cohort of founders that are like project managers with two to three years experience at a FANG uh, who, you know, they're smart, capable people, but they're more like the people who would have been at like international banking or Goldman Sachs or something. 15 years ago. I, I agree with that. And um, I'm going to say that the blame for this uh, has to lie. This is just my opinion, but lies mm -hmm. on the shoulders of Sam Altman. Um, because, oh. because his post um, that basically says, I, if I try and do something, I don't just try and go for the next step, step mm -hmm. function increment. I basically go for an exponential, basically go massive or don't even try, just go huge or go home. And he has a whole blog post about that. And just, it just goes into lots of details about how he wants everything to be absolutely exponential. And so, you know, the only way you could make something like, um, YC exponential is by taking the soul away. <laughs> I mean, what other option is there? Interesting. Yeah. So I, I thought, I had a little different idea because like, like Black, um, Paul Graham also wrote about black swan farming. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think, you know, going for the like exponential or at least like, you know, hugely outside returns is what it's been the whole time. But uh, some of this to me just seems like it's an inev inevitable result of something that's doing well and growing. Like uh, um, it's, well, say like with Hack Reactor, that coding boot camp I went to, I was in the cohort number two. So when I started, no one had finished yet. And we didn't even know if it would work. Like we didn't even know if the other people would get, if the people from the first cohort would get hired. You know, it could have just been a complete failure. And that attracted people like me. And six cohorts later, you know, I, I'd still go hang out and meet a bunch of the, the students there it was a lot of people who were like 
leaving finance jobs or like went to uh, an Ivy League school or something and they're like, oh, we know this, this, uh, you know, this is a really effective school and it gets people, you know, into top tech companies often. And there was, you know, it was, it was totally the same kind of trade off. Like when I started the uh, people who started Hack Reactor, Marcus, who used to teach at Twitter and uh, Sean, who used to uh, work at OkCupid and a number of other places, like they were teaching us all the development. And, you know, I'm sure like a couple of years later when, and I know like, you know, people in my cohort were all pretty happy with Hack Reactor and everyone who went fairly early was, but a couple of years later, they, I'm sure they had a much better system, but the original founders weren't like, you know, putting everything they had in it just to make it work. You have to um, more, more it's like, mechanical. It's like when um like when a restaurant chain um starts off and it's one it's one restaurant, and what's great about it is you know the, a lot of things that sort of don't scale and that are specific to one restaurant, right? So then when you bring it to the next level and you turn it into a hundred restaurants, you sort of need people who know how to maintain the personability of it. Um, as it scales out, and I, I bet it's just the same thing as this. It's just that there's no people who ac who um, who are experts at that. Like how, you know, like where where would they have had the training ground? You know, how do you become an expert at like scaling the personability of Y Combinator? It's like I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, and at the beginning, they didn't know Y Combinator would work, right? It was just, yeah, exactly. It was, yeah, it was just some really interesting, thoughtful people that were doing everything they thought would work. And giving it their all, so it's. I mean, well, it's, it's like what's. I was just going to say that's something that I find really fascinating and and very cool about True Space, the company that I work for. Um, so what they do is they they're trying to get companies from one million to to ten million. So they they essentially get a lot of times like the the YC rejects who just got to one million or two million revenue and never went to billion dollar companies. And then the VCs don't care about them anymore. And they, they're making profit, they're making money, but they're just not going ballistic. But they also can't quite work out how to get to the next level up, which is like 10 million. So and by reject, you mean they got funded by YC, but then they couldn't get more funding after? YC, YC being a placeholder for venture capitalists, they, they, got funded oh, okay. by venture, they got funded by venture capitalists. They got to like one or two million. And then because they weren't going hockey stick, they were like, okay, forget about you guys. And the next, the next goal was just, you know, we'll we'll try and do a merger merger acquisition with you one day. We'll we'll come back to you at some point. Um, so because VCs don't really care about those companies that aren't going to ten x. Um, so we we sort of open them with well, you know, we welcome them with open arms and bring them in. And we and Charles Fred had, does this thing called the CEO Academy. So once every uh, once a month or once every couple of weeks, we do a CEO CEO Academy. We bring in 10, 10 CEOs of these million dollar companies and we go through a three day academy which Charles leads. And the reason why I'm saying this is because what they've paid so much attention to, which I, I never even thought of myself, they make these beautiful like gift boxes um, hmm. for every single day. And so the gift boxes have interesting like things like uh, just, just all sorts of things that relate to the business exercise. And so then every day you get in the mail a, a gift box, uh, more like a crate with like, hey, almost like something you'd find in Indiana Jones, you know. Wow. And so, so that's part. So it, it feels very, um, even though it's virtual and like scaled, as it were, it feels very individualized and special. And, um, you know, we've paid a lot. Of, well, not not me personally, because I'm not the experienced designer, but the experienced designer has paid a lot of attention to making that that experience feel personal um, at scale. And so I, it is possible, you know, it's possible. That's the thing. That's what I was going to say there. Yeah, I, I think you would need you'd need more people involved. Like, like it's it's really hard to. I think I guess the thing that's hard to scale about it is like that you need a close connection with with your direct mentor or at least I, I think that probably helps a lot wouldn't that wouldn't you get that by taking old alum like you could scale it via old alumni so basically you know if you'd been doing it the whole time and you'd been working with alumni and then they'd become successful you could say okay now you're can you do me a favor and just take a group of 10 
So, so that's your yeah. sort of, you know what I'm saying? Like, like multi-level marketing. Sort of like multi-level marketing. Multi yeah. multi-level mentoring. <laughs> multi-level mentoring, yeah. But because each one of those had gone through the original group, you know. Yeah, I, I then, think that would be the way. Yeah, yeah. So we've solved YC. YC, that's fine. That, that's what right, we do. Yeah. Here. Yeah, that's what we do on the show. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I just want to get in really early to whatever the next next thing is. That's, that's <laughs> the what new I do. new thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the new 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 thing. Yeah. Um, cool. What was the blog? Po oh, yeah. So just very quickly, that one blog post that I wrote that got no attention on Hacker News, but I thought it was kind of cool, was um, with Plugio. When I made Plugio, Plugio was working, you know, worked well for a couple of years. And all of a sudden, one day, the shit hit the fan and it was like completely stopped working. I was like, what the? What, what, what happened? Well, what happened was they... Um, I believe that Amazon upgraded the underlying database. And so it sort of it was like a, a Pocona upgrade. And basically, the database went 10 times faster. So what happened was there was um, Ajax calls going on in the back end that used to take, you know, like 100 milliseconds or whatever, or 200 milliseconds. And now they'd gone down to 10 milliseconds. So all the people, all the people who were on the app using this thing, I hadn't set a proper timeout on it. So uh -huh. basically, because the database was slow, it was creating a natural timeout. <laughs> and then when the database was upgraded, there was no timeout. And everyone, all these connections came in and I DDoSed myself. <laughs> so, so basically, a, a slow database query was, was the reason why my app worked for two years. When did you post that to Hacker News? Um, I can't. I can't find it. I, I can't find it. But it's, it's, oh, it's definitely a long time ago. It's, yeah, it's it's a long time ago. Yeah. But basically, it was a slow database query that was keeping my site up for like two years, and that was. I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, yeah like it, like it, it needs to be slow. <laughs> it needs to be slow. Relies on that. <laughs> yeah, like it needs to be slow because it's just the right timeout. Yeah. Not a safe way to go. No. Um. um yeah, so well, that, any, was, that was good. Yeah. So, any uh, like any changes in in your plans on uh, like the balance with with like the Roblox game? Actually, how's the Roblox game going? That's maybe that's the most. Interesting I am question. so freaking excited about the Roblox game. Um, I've just been exploring music for it and audio effects, and we've he's. So the game, I don't mind saying what the game is called. It's it's called Slider, and it's it's sort of like it's going to be like this. Um, it, it's like a, a sort of light-hearted, futuristic um, Blade Runner type of world, um, hmm. but like like some of the lighter side of Blade Runner, not like the dark sides, more like the like the sort of large expanses of light lightness and stuff. And anyway, it's 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 great working with someone else because my ideas were one thing, but then when, once I'm working with Anthony, he's adding in his own creative ideas, and he's just come out of like a game building degree or something like that yeah and um yeah it's just he's he first of all he mo he mocked up a giant map in um photoshop and now he started building out that map and we've got different challenges and different fun things happening and shops everywhere and like it's all it's all on islands in the sea and like you can sort of jump around and like fly between islands and and we've got different i'm just coming up with different sound effects and we're sort of really zoning in on what the visual look and feel is it's uh, initially it was just supposed to be just a really simple game to just take advantage of the fact that roblox is quite popular but yeah. the problem is you know the more i get into these things the more i'm like oh wait we could do something really cool here this could be like a great you know some something groundbreaking for roblox so i'm kind of ugh, i just can't can't help wanting to uh, make it a bit uh -oh. better you know so uh, so, uh, so how long do you think that's going to take to ship no, not long. I mean, I, I like three months at the max. You know what I'm saying? Like three months would be definitely an outside number. Um, it it could probably ship sooner, but I might just want to make it a little bit more of a good first impression. I guess the fact that you're paying someone as opposed to spending your own time on it does put a natural break on that that oh, yeah. uh, that tendency to just add more and more and more and more. Oh yeah, it's I'm really paying. Yeah, definitely paying attention to the different things um the but also i do think it should have attention to detail so the plan that we've the plan that we've come up for building it or that, that i've 
um, sort of um, guiding Anthony towards this. So he's created this big map and there's a lot of placeholder things and a lot of ideas. But in the center of the map is like one basic challenge and a shop. And mm -hmm. what, what I'm saying is, okay, look, let's just get the center of this whole map like the final game. So just like, like in terms of progressive rendering, thinking about that mental model, let's just progressively render to what, what would be a release candidate the first like 100 yards around the center of this game. Because essentially that is, that is going to be the, the UX and the, the experience of the whole game. So if, if at least that, that way, we'll just have this tiny portion of the map that we can get just right, and then we'll understand how to scale the experience to the whole map. So it'll be sort of go slow to go fast. You know, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, 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 it makes sense. Yeah, so that's, that's what we're going to do. I think the next couple of weeks is just going to be getting this, this little 100-yard section just right and then going, okay, right, now we know what this game is. You know? Like, this is what the music is. This is what the, this is what the dynamics are. This is what the walls look like. Yeah. Sounds fun. I'm, I'm uh, more looking forward to Task Flow, though. Oh, yeah, me too. I so, mean, so I can uh, <laughs> properly assess which of the many things I could do I should be working on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I I've desperately do want Task Flow to exist, and I find myself going back to looking at mock-ups of it and like reminding myself how, how it works and then applying those concepts to my tasks to help me decide what to do. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm still kind of at that point where I've got to, I'm juggling like how much time do I spend on Phoenix Igniter? How much time? And I know like that's worth, I, I need to put in a lot of time. I need to get at least a beta. I was hoping to do it this month. It may be, you know, early next month. And then how much time do I spend screencasting? How much time do I spend uh, doing something else that can help promote Alchemist Camp? Like uh, writing blog posts, submitting that to Hacker News. Like there, I've actually that last category I've mostly just not done. And I, I think it could be really valuable, but it's, uh, it's harder, to, harder to estimate. And you know, the, other, the other concerns are pressing, so it's, yeah. It's definitely a lot of optimization to. It would be part of a larger, Would it be part of a larger strategy though? To like you, posting a blog post to Hacker News? Is it just for the blog post's uh, sake, or is it for like Igniter, or is it for Alchemist Camp? What would it? What's it for? Okay, so it's it's basically because the uh, the main thing that drives like how successful Alchemist Camp is is probably the number of well it's it's two things it's like how good is the content like how how long do people stick around and how how fast do i build the, the top of the funnel which is generally getting email signups um, or youtube subscribers also counts um it's a lot harder to share a video with someone who doesn't know me because watching a video is a big ask but like a text-based tutorial is easier than that and then even easier than that is, is like a, a higher level, more general blog post. And people who, you know, it's like people who watch my tutorials have a way deeper connection than someone who just reads a blog post. But the number of blog posts that you can read or that I can read or anyone can read is just an order of magnitude more than, than like, you know, 20 minute YouTube tutorials they go through. So it's, I think it's just, uh, it's probably a way to reach a lot more people, but I'd have to, you know, like it, it, it would take work and I gotta, gotta, you know, write the right thing and, and, uh, uh, get it shared online somewhere. For those blog posts, would you want them to go directly to video content or would you have like an intermediary layer of content that was like, you were gradually bringing people down a funnel? like of more specialized content towards videos? Um, so the, the articles which on Alchemist Camp, which are tutorials, would just be the tutorial. There's no video link to it, but they're on the site. The, uh, the more general blog posts, I'd probably just put those on the questing log site and people who subscribe to that get future blog posts from that. Um, it doesn't, include any videos, but it links to Alchemist Camp and it talks about what I'm doing there. So okay. I, I think 
it's it's just a top of the funnel thing and, and mm -hmm. for me it's like top of the funnel is site traffic it's twitter followers it's youtube followers yeah. and like the the next layer under that that gets you know that, that's like really easy to quantify in terms of of monetary value is email subscribers okay yeah you know ass assuming like the quality of subscribers doesn't take a nosedive dive once mm -hmm. i once i write broader stuff which it could yeah well it so. probably could it was the, that's why i was wondering like do you have do you have like a larger fly net that then brings people into a more specialized and then that's where you try and get them into your emailing list i don't know but um how, how do you mean well because if if you're writing very broad general content and then they're getting on your emailing list but your emailing list is really quite specific to you know um uh, elixir that's kind of problematic you know because you've oh, just got oh. a quite unqualified emailing list then the uh, well so the people that subscribe to the blog just get articles from the blog they okay. don't get they don't get alchemist camp updates oh got it yeah yeah okay what's the but, what's questing log that's my what's, blog that's my new so blog your blog is called questing log i didn't know about that yeah yeah that's and the one i showed you that i made with view press you did yeah show, can you show me again yeah sure thing oh, you show me so much we do just, so much. Uh, I was just checking out your your hacker news history when you uh, when you mentioned that submission. Uh, oh yeah. So questing log. Um, so it's got a link to Alchemist Camp right at the top. Link to the YouTube channel. Link to an old blog. And on this one, uh, I've only I've only written two posts, but they both you know got some amount of following. Go to and the homepage again. Oh, this is why I just want a blog like this. View press. View, view press. Yeah. And it's, it's out the box, is it? But is it like Elixir or some, some weird technology? It's view, like Vue.js. Oh, okay. View press. Yeah. It, this is actually the same thing I use for uh, Phoenix Igniter uh, docs. So if you go here like this all this documentation that i made was also using the exact same technology mm. so, so viewpress is it's like gatsby but it's less flexible and it's it's much faster to get going with okay and it's view instead of react something that i'm there's one thing that i find frustrating in my in my tool chain which is um, i don't have an easy way like a really quick way to spin up a new server that could host something like that, you know, like, so, okay. I have I, that. I, I, you do have that. I wish I had that. And that, I that's, the you, I you, that's the droplet thing that you showed me. I saw that. Yeah. It, I, it's like literally a, a secret page on my site where I type in the, uh, the domain and my email and click a button. And then it does like all the Nginx setup, all the, you know, fetching, a. Um, or installing CertBot, getting the, uh, yeah, the so SSH certificates, all that. What I have is for every environment, like like Nugget or whatever, I can create new servers like beep, click a button. It does exactly the right server for that environment. But what I don't have is a way to create a new environment, just a new thing from the ground, you know, a new server, a new place for like a website or something like that. Wait, 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 wait. what do you mean by a new server for that environment? Like you have nuggets running on multiple servers? Yeah. Why? Well, because, you know, it's just, a, just I've just found that distributed systems for those kind of uh, sites keep them lightning fast, you know? Oh, how many, how many servers is it running on? Well, it, it's, it's built on, um, it's built, I've got, sort of got this architecture that was with salt stack that means that it would be easy for me to, break everything up into any number of servers, you know, one per service or a cluster of servers. But I, I think Nugget, I think it's just three. I've just got like one um, salt stack server and then maybe a, a couple of like just, just servers that do everything. You know what I mean? So like it, they are the job server. They are the web server. They're, they're kind of like an everything server, but it'd be super easy for me to split it up into this, the, you know, here's five job servers, here's two web servers. 
that kind of stuff I can do really fast. So that's I've got the 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 framework for an infrastructure. What I don't have is just a way to quickly go. Here's my new my just my new one thing. You know? Gotcha. So, so salt stack that's like the Python equivalent of like Chef or Ansible yeah, or yeah. something like that. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. 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 Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So because um, I just haven't, I've just never really spent the time to make that part easy. Um, and I don't have an environment because I don't like to mix environments. So for example, with Amazon, you know, I've got a different Amazon account for, for Nugget. I've got a different Amazon account for the uh, other, you know, for Speak, right? I don't really want to mix Nugget and Speak into the same Amazon account. So okay. what I really need is another Amazon account, which is just bits and shits. <laughs> and basically, okay, I could just spin up some stuff in this account, you know. Like a different user account, you mean? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I do a different user account because I want because I've I've gone through the pain of like um, having it all intermingled and then needing to separate it, and it's really painful. Is it? Wow. With like a due due diligence type stuff, or you know, migration type stuff, like when you know you want you want to try and keep those kind of things those those business concerns separated if possible because you may sell it one day you may you know there's just any number of things yeah. you can do and it's gonna so, be so, so what painful. I've, what i've done with phoenix igniter even though i probably won't ever sell that um and what i'll definitely do with with the next uh, the next one the analytics one which maybe i could sell if everything goes well yeah uh, is i've i put it on a separate stripe account or not a separate uh not a separate login but like a separate um like a separate dashboard you yeah. know how you can toggle between your yeah, multiple yeah. accounts. Yeah. You, can that, trans yeah. you can transfer one of those to someone else. So mm -hmm. I've got a, a separate one of those and then a separate DigitalOcean droplet. Mm -hmm. But not a whole different like DigitalOcean account. Yeah, that, that's the way I do it. And I wouldn't want them all intermingled like that. Because wow. because because it grow because like it can kind of grow pretty big. So for example, something Nugget uses is like a memcached. So mm -hmm. you've got you've got like an Amazon service memcached, you've got Amazon um, RDS stuff, so it's using Am Amazon databases f uh, served by RDS, Amazon memcached served by memcached. Then it's got web servers on the front end. Then it's got a salt stack machine. So you could imagine it's already a bit distributed and scaled. And now if I had like speak in that same thing, <laughs> like with a similar level of like distribution, it would be like oh be so annoying and difficult to like separate those two things well i i know my solution what is it use a more efficient tech stack yeah that's, I, that... I believe uh my, so alchemist just just guessing off of your alexa rank alchemist mm -hmm. camp had about uh three times the traffic that nugget has now uh when it was still on a, a five dollar a month bottom tier droplet and I had other stuff running on the same droplet. I finally mm. like pulled it out into its own thing and added some memory just to speed up the uh, uh, just speed up the builds. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's it's literally just like all on one single droplet. I mean, that probably does come from um, it probably does come from working in distributed systems, building a lot of websites on distributed systems, and probably like over optimize like i know what the minimum distri distributed system is for like major optimization and i i'm extremely optimistic in thinking okay you know i'm going to get like 50,000 people on this and i want it to be ready for it <laughs> no it, like, it's, i, I can, think there's so that, why not do that <laughs> it's the the scalability arrogance uh, that uh, yeah. podcast and like solo podcast thing i i did I was on that but i i think um, it depends on your setup but i suspect I suspect, like with modern Laravel, you can get a lot of users before it's. I mean, it's not as many as Elixir, but I think it'd be a lot. I could certainly do that because, um, I mean, I could I could certainly create one Amazon account because basically every single site that I do runs on local machine in one instance. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like, so it all it all it all breaks down to a single server. No, you know, without a problem. It's just. I guess I've just got in the habit of like did, scaling it. <laughs> did you ever listen to like the really old Stack Overflow podcast when it was uh, Jeff and Joel? Yeah, yeah. 
So they talked about scaling Stack Overflow. And they had millions of users before they did any horizontal scaling. They, when they finally needed to do some horizontal scaling, they had uh, uh, one of the Reddit founders on the show and they were talking about it. But I think at that time they had something like like 5 million monthly active users or 10 million or something it's on true. 2008 it's, hardware. It's true because like, you know, user requests, like what, it's really difficult to get to say 100 requests a second. Like that's really, really difficult to yeah. get to, even with a shitload of users. Um, so it's true. I'm, I'm definitely, this is an area that I've, I could improve. You know, you're, you're very, very correct here. Yeah. It, it's, I, I did some load testing on my site and it, uh, it basically maxes out around a thousand requests a second. And I haven't done like everything super efficient, but you know, Elixir is pretty efficient in its nature and I've, um, I'm not doing anything like super expensive with it. But also, I just want a couple of blog. I just want it for a couple of blogs or whatever. I just wonder if I should just even be bothering doing my own infrastructure. Like maybe there's just some site that I could sign up to that just gives me the blogs I need. Oh, um, so you know so I mean? one thing I totally forgot to mention. So I I do have a whole bunch of Elixir sites like all on the same DigitalOcean droplet, and I've got a couple of WordPress blogs on the same DigitalOcean droplet. Those are those are. Uh, mostly abandoned blogs at this point. But that one that I just showed you, the questing log, that's on render. Mm, like render.com. Render.com was started by, uh, I believe, Stripe employee number eight, who did like all <laughs> their infrastructure yeah. Yeah. For, for many years. And, and they're basically like, they're like what Heroku would be now if Heroku were a startup and it weren't like owned by Salesforce and Horrible. Okay, so render, yeah. Yeah. Since ViewPress makes static sites, I can host it for free there. Hmm. So you don't get comments, you don't get like a login or anything like that, but if you're just hosting a static site, like as many as you, you can want. You can do comments with Discus though, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and no limit. You can just do all those free. Hmm. Um, although, I don't, I don't, did you see how I do comments? No. Oh, I, I have to share the screen again. This is uh, uh, this is just a little bit too good to pass up. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is probably not. Uh, this is probably frowned upon. Um, but the way I do comments on this site is every time I make a blog post, I submit it to Hacker News, and then at the bottom, write comment on H Ed. And then I put that link, like I, I basically uh, redeploy the site with that link in it. So the comments for that blog post are all here. That's quite interesting. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even consider it if it weren't for the fact that this is basically in the sweet spot of, you know, hacker newsy stuff. Um, you could take that. me to find you, a different way, but. But you I know something, it's... you could take that one step further and put it in an iframe right there. This in an iframe? Yeah. Oh, so you, so you like you click it and you just see the you hacker news yeah, you don't even, embedded in your, in your site. You don't even click bottom. it. It's just embedded. It's, you just embed it in an iframe right there. They have to be logged in. What, to see the comments? To comment, right? I mean, they they pretty much would be. I mean, who isn't logged in? I mean... I'm, do you log, out logged of, in. <laughs> do you log out of Hacker News? I, I mean, I'm always logged in. It, it, it remembers. Only, your... only if I reboot my computer or something. But, but so, so the thing is, it would literally display the comments right there. <laughs> That's kind of interesting concept. It's, I would like to see that. Not, not because I think it's a good idea, but because I think it's interesting. Yeah, that would be very, very yeah. interesting. And that could start an interesting trend if you did that. <laughs> that could... Yeah, that could get me complained at, I think. Possibly. Yeah. They're like, hey, we're not a comment hosting service. <laughs> I mean, aren't they? Why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just use a kludge. Make it happen. They probably like growth. You know. Probably, probably. Um, so, um, yeah, let's, let's do goals for uh, next time. So, well, I'll just say mine real quick. It's 
it's basically a little bit of progress with with the slider, the game, and um, hopefully a little bit of progress with Nugget, um, rounding it out. Just need to think through the different user journeys. You know, free user, a user who's just starting out, a user who's finished the boot camp, a user who's in Slack, who isn't in Slack. There's just a lot of different pathways, and I just need to make them all work and look good and uh, just drive everyone down the funnel, really. Cool. Uh, for me, it's going to be publish two YouTube videos because mm. doing three this week was really rough. I, I do need to keep, keep up a good cadence, but I, th I think two is more reasonable. Uh, do that and put in a bit more time preparing for the interview. I haven't, haven't really uh, mm. done too much. Uh, I, I've only done a tiny bit of uh, algorithm prep. And number three, which is also really important, is do at least five components for Phoenix Igniter. Five components? Five UI components. Oh, okay. I've just got to keep that's... making some measurable amount of progress on it. That sounds like a lot of work, but maybe it isn't. Oh, I, I mean like a simple, simple component, like a pill, like a button, like stuff like that. Okay, got it. it yeah, it's basically just, just CSS and HTML components. Uh, and that is it. Yeah, I just pasted you a link to that. Um, the only reason my app work was due to a slow database. And you can put that in the show notes. Uh, maybe I'll put it in put it in a notes doc. And uh, cool. All right, man. This has been an interesting one. Yes, yes. <laughs> may may take a lot of editing, but uh, it's been good. <laughs> All right. See All you right, on the other next side. time. Cheers.